In today's video, I'm talking about Linda Sun. I'm gonna tell you what I like and what I don't like. In fact, I might lose some subscribers over this video. If you don't know who I am, my name is Kevin and I am making eating disorder recovery simple. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button so you never miss a video. I'm releasing new content every week. Don't forget to join my email list. There are details in the description box. I'm talking about Linda Sun. Linda Sun joined YouTube in the spring of 2020 and she has seen spectacular growth since then. I'm going to answer the question, why is she so popular? And I'm going to look at some of the things that she says. Remember, this video is for entertainment purposes only. She started off by doing workouts of popular YouTubers like Whitney Simmons and Blagalotti's and a bunch of other uh, YouTubers that make workouts for people who work out at home. And then she made a series about healing her relationship with food and her body. To make this video, I looked at four of her videos. So no, I have not watched all of her videos. Let's take a look at Linda Sun's videos. I'm not a big fan of cheat days in general. I don't think you really need a cheat day. Is your diet so bad that you need to have a bunch of junk food once a week? And the problem with cheat days, first of all, the word itself, you're cheating. Cheating implies that you're doing something wrong. There's nothing wrong about having pizza and beer and ice cream, it's just food, but it's probably not going to help your weight loss goals, your physique goals, or it's definitely not gonna help your recovery goals either. But also, a cheat day can turn into a massive binge, and that's the problem. If you have any history of binge eating, I highly recommend you avoid cheat days. I never have cheat days. I don't feel the need to have cheat days. They're unnecessary. I don't feel so deprived that I need to have a ton of sugar and flour one day a week. Eat everything you want. Doesn't that sound so appealing? I'm seeing the words no restrictions in a lot of titles these days. It's, it's so appealing that you can eat without restrictions. Well, here's the truth about restrictions. We live in a world with restrictions and limitations, right? You can't just do whatever you want. We live in a world of limits. We have limited time. We have limited energy. We burn a limited number of calories. We have a limited amount of money, which means we need to budget. I think the idea of no restrictions and no limitations appeals to our hindbrain because our brains are adapted for a world with limited resources. Our brains are used to not having a lot of resources. So when you hear the words, no restrictions, our brains go crazy. That could be one reason why her channel has grown so fast. I was so confused why I couldn't live and be happy and love my body while still eating. I was in awe of people who could eat and be full and be confident and not be controlled by food like I was. But I, just I always ask this question too, why can't it just be like everybody else? Well, first of all, this is a waste of energy for a couple of reasons. One, you don't know what everybody else is going through. In fact, there's probably somebody in your life that has a similar problem. There's probably somebody that is dealing with excess weight or overeating or even binge eating. The thing is, they don't tell you that. They're not gonna put that in their Instagram profile. Oh, I struggle with eating issues. No, people only show the best parts of their lives. And not only that, but you need to focus on yourself, especially if you're in recovery. What can you do today? Look at today and yesterday. How could you have done better? That's a better question to ask. Quit asking yourself how you can be normal, whatever that is, just like everybody else. The truth is, most people in your life probably aren't normal in at least one way. Made those memories, or gone out to that party, or caught up with this friend, or enjoyed this meal with my family in order to save some calories, in order to stay this weight, in order not to ruin my progress. Now saying no to social events, that's not necessarily a bad thing. As you get older, you have to learn how to say no. There are some things you don't need to attend. You don't need to go to every Christmas party. You don't need to go to every wedding. And you don't need to go to every bridal shower either. It's okay to have limits. It's okay to protect your time. You have to protect your time. So just saying no to social events is not necessarily a bad thing. But if you're saying no because you're afraid to overeat or binge eat, or you don't want to blow your diet, that's a problem that you need to deal with. And okay, are McFlurries the most nutritious thing that's going to fuel my body? Probably not. But did it fuel my soul and my happiness in my life? I'd say so. Okay, McFlurries should not feed your soul and your happiness. I see so many food ads that say something like, eat your way to happiness. I think that was Golden Corral. 
But food advertisers have done a really good job of equating their food, their product with happiness and positive feelings. No wonder everybody's fat these days because we think food is happiness. Food has become another version of porn. It's become another form of entertainment. And nobody calls it out because basically everybody's doing it. Having a McFlurry isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's amoral, right? It's just a McFlurry. It's just a bunch of fat and sugar. Yum. I used to binge on milkshakes. I used to get a medium milkshake at Sonic. It was like a thousand calories. It was delicious. It was good. But when it comes to high fat, high sugar foods, you have to make a judgment call. Is the short term pleasure worth the long term cost? Now, having one McFlurry is probably not going to cost you any years of your life, not even a week, maybe not even a day. But what if you had one McFlurry a day instead of saying an apple a day? keeps the doctor away. What if you said a McFlurry a day keeps the doctor away? You would not get good long-term results. But balancing long-term objectives with short-term pleasure is a balancing act that you are going to play every day for the rest of your life. Thin privilege highlights that respect and equal treatment shouldn't be privileges reserved for smaller bodies. Everyone should be treated the same, no matter their size. It supports the idea that those with a thin body type have more advantages than those who don't, leading people to think that thin people have it easier. This is a all right, let's talk about thin privilege here. Yes, people who are in shape get more attention, they get treated better. You can say that's unfair, probably, but you know what? Short people also get the short end of the stick a lot of times. All things considered, short people are less likely to get hired for a job. If I put that I'm 5'4 on a dating app, I get less attention than the guys who put six foot one. It is what it is. Instead of complaining about thin privilege, why don't you do everything that you can to maximize your potential? If you're weak in one area, improve it. If you're not eating right, if you have eating issues, correct those. Do everything you can before you start complaining about thin privilege. I never felt skinny. Why can't I just be more than my size? This is so cliche, you are more than your size. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we hear that so much from health at every size and intuitive eating. Yes, you are more than your size. You are more than your body. Even if you are overweight, even if you were obese, you are still worthy. We get that. It's a straw man argument. Nobody's saying that your weight is your worth. Nobody says that. If you find somebody who's saying that, let me know and I'll make a response video to that. But the belief that your worth is tied to your size, that is a belief that you created. Imagine just being born with such an amazing relationship with food. These comments are the funniest because no one is born with an amazing relationship with food. We are Here's the truth, nobody's born with a relationship to food. When you're a baby or a toddler, you just eat to satiety. It's very simple. But you know what? We're not kids anymore. We're not toddlers anymore. We have concepts like metabolism, like calories, like macro macronutrients, organic, non-organic, pesticides. Life gets a little more complicated as you get older. Everything gets more complicated. Yes, I would like to be ignorant sometimes. I wish I knew nothing about nutrition and I just ate to fullness and I didn't know anything about calories and I somehow ended up with a great body at the end of the day. Some people love structure, discipline, meal planning, counting macros, counting calories. Here's a super the truth is most people who are in really good shape, they track things, they quantify things, they know numbers. Imagine running a business without understanding numbers. Well, that's kind of like having a good body. If you want to have a good body, if you have any sort of physique goals or weight loss goals, you have to talk in numbers. What worked when you were a kid isn't going to work when you're an adult. Actually, my relationship with food involved me asking myself if one banana was too much, maybe I should only have half, not adding peanut butter, too many calories, throwing out the entire pantry of chips and snacks so I wouldn't be tempted. If I eat these fries today, I have to eat super healthy tomorrow. If I Everything is a trade-off in life. I could be doing anything, but I chose to make this video. This YouTube channel takes me about mm, five or six hours a week to maintain. What else could I do with that five or six hours? I don't know, I could play video games, I could read books, I could travel, I don't know. But I made this call, I made this decision. Whenever you eat something, you are making a trade-off. When they bring donuts to the office or to the meeting on Friday, you can have a donut, you'll enjoy it, it'll be entertaining, but what's the long-term cost? One donut, probably not much. But if you had a donut every morning, what would be the long-term cost? Get my point? Life is filled with trade-offs. 
It's not yes, it's not no, it's not good, it's not bad most of the time. Most of the time, it's what cost are you willing to pay? But my weight will never determine what I allow myself to eat. I will not let it ever control me again. Weight will never be a factor to whether I'm happy with myself, if I'm proud of myself, if I can or cannot eat that. Weight shouldn't dictate what you eat to an extent. If you gain two pounds in a day, that could easily be water or food weight. However, if I were five feet four inches and I weighed 160 pounds, that should dictate what I eat. If I am really overweight, I need to limit the sugar, the flour, and the oil. That's all there is to it. Choices have to be made. Something has to go. And if you want to lower your weight, if you want to improve your health, a lot of times you have to sacrifice some taste and flavor. So I'm going to assume that what she means is that daily fluctuations should not alter what you eat. Your diet should be more or less the same. And if your diet is more or less the same and your consumption is the same, you shouldn't worry about the daily fluctuations. But if you start seeing an upward trend over time, then you need to take corrective action. Some people like structure. I like structure. I like being consistent. I like routine. I like doing things the same time each day. I like doing certain things at the same time each week and each month. Structure is good. I feel bad for people who don't have any structure and they have to think about what they're going to do every day. Habits are a good thing. Routines are a good thing. Going to bed at the same time is a good thing. Tracking is a good thing. When you track things, they tend to improve. That's why I recommend it to the people who work with me. Tracking, numbers, it's not bad. Starving myself, controlling my intake, counting and measuring and estimating and under eating to get to a body that didn't even exist. A goal that wasn't even real. That is a lot of work for nothing. Like, what was she chasing? I mean, she was probably a teenager when she started this journey, and she was spending all this time working out, skipping social events, and counting things, quantifying things. That's a huge cost. That takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of mental energy. And for what? I like to say that unless you're being paid, unless you're a professional, you don't need to spend all day thinking about what you're going to eat and thinking about your exercise routine. If you're a model or you're an athlete, then yeah, it should consume a good portion of your time because you're being paid to look and perform a certain way. But most of you watching this are not models or athletes. If you are, let me know. But it's not necessarily wrong. If your primary goal in life is to have a certain physique, fine, just understand the cost to that. What else could you be doing? What else could you be thinking about? Remember, time and energy are finite resources. You can't buy them. You can buy back more money, just not time and energy. Kindness and confidence kind of goes hand in hand with how I'm taking care of my body. I realize the times I'm most confident is usually when I'm doing things I know are good for my body, my health, and my hygiene. When I good decisions lead to more good decisions. This is basically the concept of momentum. When you don't have momentum, it's hard to get. But once you get it, it's awesome. You feel amazing. Good decisions are easy to make. And then you make one good decision and they make another one and you start seeing progress and it's just like autopilot. It's like you can't lose. But the opposite is true too. When you're losing all the time, it's really easy to keep losing. Once you get the momentum, grab it, squeeze it, and don't let go. No food is off limits. I'm a strong advocate for the no limitation diet. It's the only one I can sustain for my whole life. And the, five o'clock. And the only diet that makes me feel satisfied. Again, here's that concept again, no limits, no restrictions. Uh, clearly Linda has been watching the intuitive eating crowd because this is what they say. You know, don't have any restrictions. Don't say no to any food and don't forbid any food. Don't have a don't eat list. And I get what they're saying. Don't have tons and tons of rules and tons of regulations. Don't have a Bible this thick of rules because eventually you're gonna break one of them. It's much better to have habits, routines, and checklists. Checklists are actually very useful. For example, did you eat according to hunger? Did you drink enough water? Did you go to bed on time? Did you limit the flour, sugar, and the oil? Did you eat a variety of foods from the different food groups? Did you have a good workout? You don't need tons of rules. You just need to have a basic checklist. And if you're checking those boxes every day, you're going to get results over time. But I don't like this idea of no limits, no restrictions, no discipline and structure are freedom. ...ourselves to study in a field to get a certain type of lifestyle, not because we're passionate. I think it's so sad that we measure how good our lives are only as good as it looks to others, that our bodies are only as good as the compliments and comments we get from our pictures. 
Yes, people get degrees and go to university so they can have a certain lifestyle. That is true. People don't go there to learn. People don't go to university to have fun. You certainly don't go there to save money. I mean, God, what is the cost of university these days? Yet you go there so you can get a degree and show it to an employer who will pay you a better salary because you don't want to wait tables or work retail the rest of your life. And yes, a primary motivation for improving the aesthetic and the physique of your body is to increase your sexual attraction. Let me give you an example. If you loved your body, but nobody else thought you were attractive, would you really feel accomplished? Well, I love my body, even though I get no response on the dating apps, nobody ever looks at me, nobody thinks I'm attractive. Let me give you another example. If you had a product that nobody wanted to buy, but you loved the product, would you consider yourself a success? No. Success is not out there. It's not defined by a certain number in your bank account or on the scale. It's not in how many friends you have, the exact percentage you got on the test. We do a lot of things to attract other people and to capture their money and to capture their attention. It doesn't really matter what you think. It matters what other people think. We, we live in an ecosystem. We live in society. We live in an economy. And in order to survive and have a good life, you have to be able to attract other people, physically and financially. You have to have services that other people are willing to pay for. Yeah, we live in a world of standards and objective standards. Success is not a number, but a feeling. Okay, well, listen. this is why I think it's silly to say success is a feeling, not a number. Let's just say I make 30,000 a year and I play video games in my free time and I'm 35 years old and I still live with my mother. If I feel like a success, great, but would anybody else consider me a success? Am I really serving anybody? Am I using my potential? Success is in large part determined by what other people think about us. And success in many ways is determined objectively, not by feeling. Success is really just about you. It's within you. It's about how we feel about ourselves. If your business is failing, you're not going to feel like a success. If you're a basketball player and you lose by 50 points, you're not going to feel like a success. If my YouTube channel had zero subscribers, I would not feel like a success. Yes, I'm sorry, but a lot of success is measured by numbers and data. But say it here with me now, your best is enough. Please remember that your best shouldn't be compared to anyone else's best and your best is going to be different every day. Some your best is enough? Gosh, this is like toxic positivity. No, it doesn't matter what you think is the best. You can't say, oh, my best was enough. You don't pass university. You don't succeed in business because you did your best. You pass because you meet some objective standard. So saying your best is enough, no, it's not enough. People don't pay for your best. They pay for a specific result. I know that sounds kind of harsh, but life is harsh. You have to meet standards. I felt worthless. Diet culture has always told us that less is more, and I was definitely feeling less. I was Let's talk about diet culture for a little bit here, because I'm hearing this a lot. Diet culture this, diet culture that. Diet culture is the cause of every problem in the world. All right, nobody's saying that. But diet culture gets blamed for so much these days, and nobody really defines what diet culture is. If I see an advertisement for a green smoothie, or like a green supplement, is that diet culture? Is Noom diet culture? Are gyms diet culture? Are magazines diet culture? This is why I don't like the idea of diet culture. It's like this fabricated monster that nobody can define, but we can blame it for everything. I think diet culture starts up here. It's not really anything. It's just how you perceive things. It also depends on what you do with that information. I used to consume men's health a lot and a lot of other fitness magazines. They weren't responsible for my decisions. It was how I interpreted that information and it's what I did with that information. That was on me. I can't blame fitness culture or diet culture for causing my orthorexia and for causing my eating disorders. Don't blame diet culture for anything. It's all about how you interpret it. There are a lot less people judging you than you think. It's honestly just us judging and being too hard on ourselves. If we True, people aren't paying attention to you. People don't care about you. People are so self-absorbed. Everybody is so solipsistic these days. We live in the me economy. Everybody is their own brand. 
So when you go to the gym or you go to a fitness class or you go to a public venue, sorry, but nobody's paying attention to you. You are not the center of the universe. People care less about you than you think. In some ways, that's a good thing because it means that you can just do whatever that you want to do. If you're not going to the gym because you're self-conscious and you're afraid of how others will perceive you, I have good news. Nobody's going to notice you. Trying to suppress and control every bite of food is not only emotionally and physically taxing on my mind and creates stress and guilt around food, but these food rules and restrictions and this fight that's going on in my mind just causes my hunger to fight back. <laughs> It is so exhausting to think about food and weight and calories all the time. You need to divert some attention to that. You need to think about it some of the time. And if you have a weight loss goal or you're in recovery, you need to think about it a little more. You need to think about food sometimes, not 0% of the time, not 50% of the time. But if you're trying to create new habits, or you're trying to lose weight, or you're trying to stop binge eating, trying to stop purging, you have to divert some energy to that behavior because it's not automatic. That's a good thing about habits. Once you make it a habit, it becomes automatic and now that liberates energy in your head. That's one of the worst things about eating disorders is all the time that you're thinking about it. It's all the focus that you lose. It's everything else that you're not thinking about. Everything is a trade-off, right? So if you're thinking about your weight, if you're thinking about what you just ate, if you're thinking about your disorder, that is time that you're not thinking about everything else that you could be doing. I don't know, tasty? And who doesn't want to live, you know, a tasty life? Life wouldn't be life without being able to eat donuts and ice cream and cake and burgers and all of your cravings. Being able to love food is part of the whole experience. And oh, I know somebody who wouldn't want a tasty life. Me, like I'm, I'm the boring guy, right? I'm the guy who's always saying, eat boring, unexciting diets. And I do, I eat what I cook over here. I don't eat very exciting food. I could live the rest of my life without eating chocolate and cookies and ice cream. I'm not saying you should. I'm not saying that's the definition of recovery. People can overcome binge eating, they can stop overeating and still have chocolate and cookies and pizza in reasonable quantities. It is totally possible. I don't think abstinence is always the answer. In some cases, it could be the answer. Most people are able to moderate how much they consume. It takes practice, it takes a little bit of energy, but you can live a very good life without having any of those tasty things that you really like. You can live the rest of your life without amazing meals. How much pleasure and how much excitement do you want in your life? That's up to you. For me, success is living happily, fully, in love with life, and in love with your body, and in love with who you are. Not always, not every day, not all the time, but enough to know that you are more than the food that goes into your body. The numbers and measurements you hold against yourself. Again, success is not how you feel. And yes, many times success is determined by a number. Those are my thoughts on Linda's videos. Now let's get to the conclusions. First, I wanna say a few good things about Linda's videos. They are very well done. These are excellent videos. The videography is excellent. The editing is excellent. Although if I knew how much time she spent or how much an editor spent editing these videos, I think I would cry. This must take an insane amount of time to edit. All of the cuts, all of the zooms, all of the little graphics, man, these are complicated videos. And she's only, what, 19, 20 years old? She, I mean, she has quite a future as a videographer. She says she's going to school. Here's my advice for Linda. Drop out of school, drop out of university. You are wasting your time and money. Just do this YouTube thing full time. There's nothing they're gonna teach you at university that is going to be better than YouTube. Now, she is a gifted videographer and she's a great storyteller too. I think that's part of the appeal here. We listen to her narration while we see her eating delicious food for about 20 or 30 minutes. So I will grant her that. She gets an A plus for videography and scripting. Now, let me tell you some things that I don't like about this. I've already mentioned the toxic positivity, like success is how you feel, success is not a number, just do your best, blah, blah, blah. After watching several of her videos, I realized that her videos are really three parts. The first part is the amazing B-roll that she has. She's constantly eating tasty food, whether at a restaurant or in her home with her family. I think her family is Chinese Canadian. I'm not sure, maybe I'm wrong about that but they're always eating amazing food. And sometimes I think, does Linda do anything other than work out, eat, 
film and edit. I mean, that's an amazing life. If you can make a living doing that, I would do that. But sometimes when I'm watching these like what I eat in a day videos, I'm just thinking, do these people have a life? Like, it's just like they're always in the kitchen. They're always eating something. The second part is the narrative, her narration. It's Linda speaking over the B-roll. And then the third part is the music, which appeals to younger millennials and Gen Zers. So those are the three parts. You have the B-roll, which is basically food porn, and then you have uh, the narration, and then you have the music. Let me talk about the narration here. If you listen to the narration, what you realize is that it's just a string of cliches. She takes a bunch of cliches, positive statements, and she strings them together. Let me read to you some of the cliches that I heard in some of these videos. Don't hate your body, love your body, don't compare yourself, treat yourself, live life, life is too short for diets, making myself happy, balance, enjoying life, be happy with yourself, your body is a vessel, don't care what others think or say about your body. Accept your body. Be proud of your body. Be confident. Be true to yourself. You are worthy. You are successful. Show up for yourself, etc., etc., etc. I have like 15 or 20 other ones on this piece of paper. But you get the point here. She takes a bunch of positive statements and cliches and she puts them all together. I'm pretty sure that people aren't really listening to what she's saying. She could have read 30 positive statements and just repeated them in a loop over and over and over again. And I don't think people would have noticed. And I think this is my major complaint about this series is that there's just not a lot of substance. I didn't learn a lot here. I just heard positive affirmations and success is not a number and accept yourself and love your body and blah, blah, blah. The other thing too is her story. She's talking about restoring her relationship with food and loving her body again. Remember, she's 19 years old. Like, what story does she have to tell? What was the story here? Was she in high school and she saw some influencers online and she tried to look like them and she wrecked her health and she spent too much time trying to redefine her body? Now she's 19 and she knows better now and she's older and wiser. I don't, I don't know what the story is. At least Stephanie Buttermore, she was a fitness athlete. She was really lean. She realized she wasn't healthy, so she needed to gain weight. I've talked about that in my video about Stephanie Buttermore. But here, like, what is the background story? She's 19 years old. And when you're 19 years old, you don't have a lot of original ideas. You don't have a lot of stories to tell. I don't mean this to insult Linda's intelligence, but when I was 19, I didn't have a lot of big ideas either. And the reason why is because I was 19 years old and I did stupid things when I was a teenager. I didn't have life experiences. All of my major life experiences occurred in my 20s and in my early 30s. She's comparing herself to herself in high school. Listen, when you're in high school, you don't think clearly, right? You don't make great decisions. You're impressionable. You don't know what's true and what's not. You don't know how to properly evaluate information. You see something on Instagram and you're like, ooh, I'm gonna do that. Or you see a YouTube video and you're like, ooh, I'm gonna do that. That's how I was. Why? Because my brain had not fully developed. I think this whole series is a continuation of Girl Eats Food. It's kind of like Stephanie Buttermore or these other 10,000 calorie challenges or Nutty Food Fitness where we watch this attractive YouTuber just eat, eat, and eat more. It combines two things that everybody loves, sex and food. So you take a bunch of positive statements, you combine that with food, you combine that with the attraction of Linda's body, which she seems to show in every thumbnail, by the way. And then fantastic editing, and you have a recipe for success. One thing that I find somewhat disingenuous is that she says that you should love your body and that focus, you should focus less on your body and just accept it. And yet when we look at her thumbnails, what do we see? We see Linda's body in lingerie or bathing suits. If you don't think your body is that important, why would you put it in your thumbnail? Hmm. And if you don't care what others think about your body, again, the same question, why would you put it in a thumbnail? And then at some point she says she eats this way because she wants it to be a lifestyle because it makes her happy. Okay, fine, makes her happy. But then why spend so much time filming and editing this lifestyle? The last thing I wanna talk about is the growth of her channel. Linda's channel started in May of 2020. And the last time I checked, she had over three quarters of a million subscribers on YouTube. That is 
insane growth. So insane, it makes me suspicious. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how she does it. Maybe she's a prodigy, you know, I, I don't know. But it reminds me of that woman who lived in a van and she had like the snake crawling on her and she got a million subs and a month. What was, what was her name? I forget her name. I'll, I'll find that video and I'll put it in, in the description box. But there were rumors that she was an industry plant or that she was like hacking the system. I don't think Linda is an industry plant. I don't think she's hacking YouTube. Linda went from zero to 250,000 subs in four months. And then in the next 13 months, from September of last year to this month, she went from 250,000 to 750,000. I cannot explain that level of growth. There are a lot of good channels out there that have great thumbnails, great video, great everything, and they're not showing anywhere near that level of growth. Maybe I just don't understand YouTube well enough to explain it, but that is very unusual. I know a lot of great YouTubers that have 500,000 million subs, and it took them years just to hit 100,000 subscribers. So I don't know, maybe Linda is just this prodigy and we can learn something from her. All I'm saying is that kind of growth is extremely rare. Conclusions, why is her channel so popular? Again, it combines our love of food, so you have the, the food porn, and then we like to hear positive statements because they make us feel good. We like the music. The editing is really good. And then of course we see Linda's body, her really fit toned body and all the thumbnails. So there is a level of sex appeal on this channel. That's what I think. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and join my email list. Also, don't forget to check out my podcast, The Rational Eater Podcast. It's on every major platform. If you liked this video, I'm sure you'll like one of the other videos that you see on the screen. Click one of them and I'll see you there. And as always, eat the way you're designed to. And because you stuck around, I have some bonus footage for you. As I was watching Linda's videos, I was reminded of a concept called the twaddle effect. Twaddle is silly or trivial speech that doesn't mean anything. And if you listen to Linda's videos, you realize that she says a lot of things over and over, a lot of cliches, a lot of positive affirmations. And when people listen to twaddle, they're not learning anything, but they're hearing words that make them feel good. This is why millions of people are attracted to televangelists. They don't have any depth, they don't refer to scripture very much, but they say things that make them feel good. I've also done this myself. Sometimes I get really excited about a new product and I'll read all of the reviews and I'll read all the sales copy. And then I realize that I'm already convinced that this is a good product, and the reason I'm reading all of these words is to validate my decision and because it makes me feel good. I'm excited and I want to read as much as I can about this product. And I think that explains why Linda's videos are so popular because people hear things that really appeal to them. But after a while, people aren't listening anymore. They're just hearing things that they want to hear. It's kind of like binge eating. You eat and eat and eat, but after a while, you're not experiencing anything. You're just consuming the food because the food releases certain chemicals in your head and you feel good. You're not tasting anything. You're not in the moment. You just keep putting food into your mouth. That is the twaddle effect. Have you ever experienced the twaddle effect in your life? Let me know in the comments below. All right, I think I'm done.